Well, good morning, everyone. I, uh, I know we're a little bit late starting. I know there's been some uh, transportation issues this morning too, so we wanna give a little bit of grace. Uh, but we're grateful that you're here to uh, speak with us. And uh, full disclosure, uh, I have never been to SOCAP before. And most of our uh, panel has not been to SOCAP before either, which was kind of the intention of the panel. Um, so my name is Jen Collins. I run our Opportunity Zone team at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown. We're a nonprofit that sits on Georgetown's campus and we tackle social innovation and impact in a myriad of, of ways. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is by focusing on what we call fair finance, which is taking a look at the systems and structures undergirding capitalism that are perpetuating inequity. Um, Opportunity Zones fits within that portfolio, uh, and we've taken a pretty big stance on driving impact in Opportunity Zones. Um, and so I lead that work, and I am uh, grateful to be joined on the panel. I'm going to sit down because I don't want to be up at the podium, but I'm grateful to be joined on the, on the panel by uh, a bunch of folks uh, who also have not been to SOCAP before, most of them, a few of them have, um, but I want to let them introduce themselves and, um, and then we'll talk about, kind of dive into opportunity zones and what we're seeing and the unlikely partnerships that we're seeing and across the field. So I'll let John go ahead and start. Yeah, hey everybody, I have been to SOCAP before. So I know I you're like the I'm one the, I'm the person, lone, I think. the lone experienced veteran. Yep. Uh, so I'm John Letiri, I'm the co-founder of the Economic Innovation Group. We're a bipartisan research and policy organization based in DC. Uh, we helped to develop the concept behind Opportunity Zones and worked very closely with uh, legislators in the House and Senate to get it passed. And since it's been passed, we've been working with really everybody. We've been working on regulatory implementation. We've been working with mayors and governors on uh, state and local implementation. We've been working with investors, tr help, trying to help them understand what to do and, and how to put this to use, uh, community stakeholders. So really the whole gamut. Uh, very excited to be here, Jen. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so I'll go next. My name's Elise Liberto. I work at an investment firm called Brown Advisory, actually based in Baltimore, Maryland. And at the firm, I lead our private market impact investments, helping our clients find investments that both have compelling risk reward profiles, but also measurable social impact outcomes. And as everyone in the crowd and at the conference, I think, knows, the challenge is that impact means something different to every client. But one of the opportunities is finding those themes that resonate across a large percentage of our client base. And one of those themes that consistently comes up is this desire to invest in the communities that our clients came from. So once the Opportunity Zone legislation came out that I think you're about to hear a little bit more about from John pretty shortly, we really took notice to the social impact intent behind that legislation. But what we saw when managers were first coming to market, and I think as the majority of individuals saw, is that it was large groups raising large sums of capital to invest nationally, predominantly in real estate that wasn't serving a local community need. So at the beginning of this year, our firm got involved and decided it was time to create a new solution, a new partnership. And we looked to partner with someone that had experience in community development as well as private market investing, partnered with an individual that many may know named Ross Baird, who was the founder and president of an impact-oriented venture capital fund called Village Capital. And we launched a joint venture called Blueprint Local. So Blueprint Local is the management company of a family of qualified Opportunity Zone funds that were really raised with a strategy predicated on three what we think are differentiated factors. One, raising small place-based funds to invest in communities and led by local teams. Two, incorporating an impact evaluation into every investment decision that we make. And three, investing in a series of both real estate and operating company investments and community nodes to drive transformational change. So we've raised two funds to date, Blueprint Texas, focused on the San Antonio Austin Corridor, and Blueprint Baltimore, focused on Baltimore, Maryland, my hometown. So it's early days, but excited to share a little bit about what we've been doing with all of you today. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Mike Everett. Uh, I'm a president of uh, Nuovo Real Estate. We're a Denver-based uh, uh, private real estate investment firm, um, uh, part of a larger uh, family office in in, uh, in Denver and Arkansas. And we're we're primarily focused on the historic adaptive reuse space, and primarily in the in the hotel segment. Um, we've done a, a little bit of retail, a little bit of multifamily, but our our preference is to 
go by historic buildings that no one else wants to touch and turn them into hotels and, and, and do it in a, do it in such a way in, in a thoughtful, intentional, conscious way of, of, of creating impact through our hiring practices, through our sustainability work and, and, you know, really looking at a 20 to 30 year plus horizon to, uh, to think about how not only can we be profitable, but how can we be most impactful in the communities that we're, that we're investing into. Um, we're today we're focused we have a we have a hotel in baltimore as well we got a consistent theme here um hotel in baltimore um we're doing a series of projects in merced california which are um uh which are all opportunity zone projects uh we're redeveloping uh buildings in downtown st louis and cincinnati right now to convert into hotel and then we're, we're pursuing additional op or, uh closing on additional opportunity zone projects in indianapolis and cleveland by by the end of the year. Um, our focus really has been uh, in the last, I'll say year or so, as we've continued to understand and, and um, learn more about Opportunity Zones and as the, as the legislation has become clearer and clearer over time, our, our focus, our pipeline focus is 100% Opportunity Zone. We're tending to start uh, two to three different, two to three unique projects a year. And you know, with the kind of the wide swath of opportunities that are available within the secondary markets that we prefer, you know, we're, we don't traffic in New York and Washington and Seattle and Denver. You know, we tend to go to secondary markets. We have a, a huge, huge inventory of buildings that are that are available that could be converted to hotel use in these in these markets that um, that do have great opportunity zone overlays to them. So that's that's kind of what, what we're we're focused on and, and really trying to build over the course of the next you know five to ten years, build a, a portfolio of of uh, you know twenty really profitable, sustainable businesses that uh, that will will do great things in their communities. Good morning. My name is David Gross. I'm an LA-based real estate investor and developer. Um, <clears throat> and adjacent to that, I have a couple of mission-oriented um, projects that I'm focused on. I co-founded an inner-city incubator um, called Vector90 um, in the Crenshaw District of Los Angeles. We are working on replicating and scaling that to a number of other core inner cities throughout the U.S. Um, and I recently co-founded an initiative called Our Opportunity, which is a very grassroots, um, kind of locally oriented, high touch, high impact um, movement to connect people from inner cities back to the communities where they're from um, by investment. Um, the OZ incentive is something that was um, kind of a lightning bolt for myself and my partners who were already focused on inner city investment and we've shifted um, our focus almost exclusively to, to OZs at this point. And we have a number of projects in the pipeline that we're excited about. Um, I think most notably um, in the Crenshaw District, we have Nipsey Hussle Tower, which uh, we're, we're working on right now. Um, and I think the plans for that will unveil at the top of 2020. Um, <clears throat> some projects in Baltimore, Chicago, Atlanta. Um, so a number of things we're really excited about. Great. Uh, so I don't want to assume that the room uh, knows the ins and outs of Opportunity Zone legislation. So John, can you kind of help level set us and give a summary of the benefit and the intention of the, the legislation? Sure. I just want to start by honoring the Washington Nationals. Oh, I was going to get to that. Uh, um, who won their first World Series game last night. Very exciting. Go Nats. Um, we'll be doing Baby Shark later um, in honor of that. So uh, how many people just by a show of hands do feel like they're familiar with Opportunity Zones, the details of the incentive? Great. Uh, so in recapping what all of you should know, uh, it's a capital gains based incentive. So it's not an upfront tax credit. Uh, it's not limited in that sense by the, tr the traditional limitations around community development incentives, which allocates a relatively small pool of capital and spreads it over a very wide set of geographies. So the national impact is pretty thin in those uh, policies. The local impact can be significant from any one project, but you just can't allocate very many of them uh, in any given year. And so one of the core design uh, priorities behind Opportunity Zones was getting past that low ceiling of the amount of resources you could unlock, especially given the fact that in a capital gains context, the, the recovery, the economic expansion that is now in its record 10th uh, year has created a huge accumulation of new capital gains wealth in our country. That could be source capital for 
the reinvestment and redevelopment of, of communities, uh, the supporting of underserved entrepreneurs, the scaling of local businesses that have potential but don't typically have access to capital. So the idea was to connect those dots, to say we have this big pool of capital that's been untapped for community development and economic development. We have a design uh, limitation of previous programs that create a very low ceiling. Uh, and we have the inability in previous programs to do a lot of different things through the same tool. And so with Opportunity Zones, you can have in the same community, and we're seeing this in places like Erie, you can have early stage companies getting uh, investment in an innovation district, and you can have a downtown redevelopment, uh, putting a food hall and, and hospitality and all kinds of things, uh, residential real estate. You can have industrial uh, uh, investment, you can have manufacturing, you can have broadband infrastructure, all of that being financed through the same incentive. And it's worth noting, that's just never happened before. That's, this is a first in federal policy to have that diversity of things across a wide diversity of communities being supported through the same policy. Um, so that was very much the intent behind this, was to say if, if you're an investor, you have capital gains, and you're willing to reinvest uh, into these uh, designated areas, first you get the deferral, so the time value of, of not paying your tax up front but pushing that uh, back. Second, you get a step up in basis tied to longevity, so 5 or 10 percent. Uh, depending on the, the time marks, you can get up to 15% of your original tax liability forgiven. And those are both meaningful and they're, they're interesting to investors, but the, the big benefit comes at the very end uh, of the timing window, and that's the 10-year plus benefit. Any new capital gains you acquire uh, or accumulate through your investment ends up being tax-free. Uh, so that's a very significant potential benefit, but it's not a guaranteed benefit. You have to have additional capital gains. You have to be invested for 10 years or more. You have to be putting your capital to risk, in many cases in communities where these are investors who, would, who have never taken a first look, let alone a second look, at a lot of the places that have been designated. So it's pushing the benefit back in, in return for patient capital. Uh, it's, it's attempting to get that connectivity between where there is a large accumulation of capital and there's a large concentration of need in our economy, and it's trying to get to a diversity of different types of needs. And again, where a lot of other policies I think have fallen short of their potential is they've created a very narrow use case. You can use this for housing. You can use this for a certain type of housing, or you can use this for a very specific type of, of redevelopment activity, and that's it. And if your community doesn't fit that specific use case, it's irrelevant to you. And so what I'm excited about with Opportunity Zones, what I'm hopeful about in the next year, is as the market matures and as we have regulatory clarity, we're going to have more creative use cases and a wider diversity of use cases, even than what we see now, which I think is already pretty remarkable in the early days. Um, but that's really the potential promise of this, is scale and diversity of activity and the concentration of a diverse set of activities in a given location that helps that entire community rise. Because again, the needs and opportunities on communities, they come in bunches. It's not just housing. It's not just a lack of new businesses. It's not just a lack of kind of basic amenities, grocery stores, uh, medical clinics. It's all of those things combined in most of these communities. So you have to have a tool that really supports potentially all of those different types of needs. Yeah, we and we, appre uh, <clears throat> we appre I appreciate the, the nod to holistic community development uh, and the needs there, therefore. Um, the original legislation before it kind of crossed the finish line did have some impact data transparency language in it that was uh, removed as the, as the uh, legislation crossed the finish line, which is why the Beck Center really decided to, to get their voice um, and be able to use our influence to get impact in the conversation and across the field in, in the best ways we can. Um, what we did was we launched what's called the Opportunity Zone Impact Reporting Framework, which is housed at ozframework.org. So if anyone's interested, I would encourage you to take a look. Uh, I personally have a real estate development and finance background, and so we really um, wanted to, this to be a helpful tool to bring uh, people who have never been into the world of impact into the world of impact. And so a lot of my time, effort, and energy is really translating by and between uh, you know, folks like the, the, the practitioners on the stage into the world of impact. Um, and we're doing that in the OZ space through this Opportunity Zone Impact Reporting Framework. So I'm very grateful to have the three practitioners on this stage be framework adopters um, and have come up with really amazing use cases for exactly what John described in terms of holistic community development uh, with real community engagement, responsible exits considered. 
standard, uh, you know, a lens on, on equity and, and transparent behavior. So I'm um, excited to get into some storytelling on, on what they're doing in the field uh, to be impact-minded uh, in this space. Um, but Elise, I want to turn it over to you because uh, you have a, kind of a, a whole swath of constituents, um, and I'm curious as to, um, you know, the, the dovetail between kind of financial investment lenses and impact lenses uh, with your clients, and kind of what does the dialogue look like around that, and yeah. Yeah, no, certainly. I think that exactly the theme of this entire panel, we haven't had, we've been very similar, I think, other organizations. And really only over the past two years have we started having those conversations around impact in your private piece of your portfolio. So I think it was a new conversation. And really where we came out was, if you look at the way the opportunities and legislation is written, we kind of decided that even though leading with impact is the right thing to do, I think the better way to describe it to clients, what we do believe is it's also the right way to drive financial returns within the confines of that legislation. And I guess to flesh that out a little bit, we think of it in kind of three ways. The first is that leading with impact is really the only way to mitigate against reputational and regulatory risks that I think are very much concentrated within this investing. On the regulatory side, we know that the legislation is still being interpreted today and we kind of came out as a firm of saying, if we're going to do something and be early movers before there's even final regulatory guidance, you need to be aligned with the impact in order to be best positioned for any change. The second, on the reputational piece, I think you're going to see a lot of groups that have been quick to put capital to work and communities they don't really know or care about be really hit long term on trust and credibility. So just full stop starting out, we thought it'd be really important that from a financial perspective, you need to be impact oriented within a qualified opportunity zone fund. Two other points. I mean, the second is that we actually are seeing also that this impact orientation is leading to deal level value add. Two quick examples that, that hopefully are interesting and relevant. The first would be proprietary deal flow. I think you're seeing that entrepreneurs as well as property owners that are located and intentionally in underserved communities actually care about the integrity of the investors that are on their cap table. A second would be additional city and state level financial incentives for having impact oriented projects. We can get into this a little bit later, but really that cross section of collaboration with government is resulting in additional tax incentives, additional financial support through grants, as well as more creative, which I think is the most interesting point, more creative support through things like fast track permitting and enabling impact oriented groups to be the ones to develop government owned land. The third just very quick point would be our focus on being really local and intentional about community orientation. I think that underserved areas are inherently challenging to be investing in, and you really need the right team and a high-touch approach to create that transformational change that we want to see. So our thesis was always do this for impact, not only just because it's the right thing to do, but because you can actually see how it would drive financial returns in the long run. Mike, do you have anything to add to that conversation? Yeah, so we... Um we're focusing on our projects in Merced, California for a second, which is, if you're not familiar, it's um, kind of really definition of, kind of central California. It's We say it's two hours from everything. Uh, Sacramento, um, San Jose, it's about an hour north of uh, Fresno. Um, and you know, Merced has historically been a um, agriculturally driven town and you know big ag in a lot of ways is is really what's been uh, behind the economy in the last uh, you know in the last several decades really um, recently as as in about fifteen years ago the um, University of California um, system opened their last campus at, at UC Merced and so that that's now at about nine thousand students and, and has really injected a new level of activity and life into the community um, but it's it's really it, it's not been enough and I think we've we've seen the need to go and help recreate the downtown landscape in, in Merced and, and hope that that's going to continue to leverage the what the university is going to do um, uh, in, in future decades and, and you know we hope to we hope to work with them um, extensively as we continue to invest in, in the community I think uh, you know to to Elisa's point around you know trying to tr you know, trying to measure our impact and trying to be uh, you know reach a level of transparency and then reach a level of partnership within the communities that we're that we're going into I think you know the biggest challenge we have had and, and I think what we've learned for our our future projects is is you know really uh, being uh, communicative up front being um, very open with our partners and that can mean a lot of things that could mean your your um, 
neighbors, that could mean the city, that could mean um, you know the operators that you bring into your uh, uh, buildings. And in, in our case, we don't operate our hotels; so we bring in a third-party operator. But you know, really bringing that entire set of constituents under the tent and and communicating to them really clearly, we're doing this. We're doing this to make money. We're also doing this to really thoughtfully impact the community over the next 20 to 30 years and and we found once we you know once we do that and the more of more of that kind of open transparency we have um, we, we create this huge momentum behind us and, and I think in candidly in, in in Merced you know that that transparency for us has, has been built over time we, we probably weren't as good at it three or four years ago as, as we are now um, but as we you know as we as we really tell the story of, of you know our intentions our, our desire and, and really need based on our opportunity zone is as, as Dave mentioned we're gonna be in here for we're gonna be in here for 10 15 20 years we've got a big um, you know we've got a you know huge incentive to, to invest for the for the future so um, you know being open really kind of getting into the getting into the, um, uh, the the nuts and bolts of what this community needs and why it needs it and how we can help Supplement the um, the local economy and how we invest and you know how we really how we really um, plan for the future five ten fifteen years out is is uh, is really important. Thanks, Mike, and and to that kind of theme of collaborative behavior needed, especially uh, with the high touch points that um, Elise so eloquently described. David, I am curious as to. Um, you're doing a lot of the really high touch, very difficult, um, very time intensive work uh, within, these, within these neighborhoods. So curious as to if you're seeing kind of, if you have any best practices or stories to share about um, things that have gone well and initiatives that have gone well or not. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll approach it from an impressionistic level first. Um, when we first opened um, our first location in the Crenshaw District for this co-working concept, Vector 90, we went into it thinking we were gonna scale fairly quickly. We, we thought we'd have you know four to six locations open in the first 18 to 24 months. Um, and almost immediately it was clear that wasn't gonna happen because you know a lot of the engagement, a lot of the impact, to make impact, it had to be very high touch. It had to be kind of person to person, business to business engagement. And the things that we were doing, they just didn't scale because it was idiosyncratic issues that we were dealing with, um, with our membership base. And for the first year, I, I, I was like, this isn't gonna scale. I don't know how this, is gonna, how this is gonna translate to rolling it out into a national model until you know, we, you know, by going through the process, we found that taking the time and really digging in the channel and focusing on individuals and, and neighborhood impact, it resonated and it, like what we were doing and why we were doing it, it did spread. And then we, we, started, um, we started to receive this national support and buy-in to this Crenshaw-based model. Um, so in a very indirect way, you know, focusing at the hyper-local level um, is giving us the momentum to now, think, to now plan on expanding. Um, but yeah, I'll be honest, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't planned in the beginning. We thought we were gonna open a door and we were gonna find something that worked in the first six to nine months and then wash, rinse and repeat, and that was not the way. But, but going through that, I do believe that you have to, as, as Elise said, you have to find a way to really drive real impact mm -hmm. and that's the only way you'll be embraced and people will, will accept you into mm -hmm. a community. Um, but I think the way forward is gonna be some barbell model where you have initiatives that are focused on the grassroots, very direct um, impact, partnering with institutional caliber, caliber institutions or organizations that have the manpower, the processes and the systems to fi identify those things that have worked mm -hmm. and then help scale them. Um, yep. So, you know, I'll give you a couple of, a couple of anecdotes. Um, we were launching, so we've partnered with some national um, organizations. So Guggenheim um, is now a partner on the financial literacy side. So we were in JP Morgan. So we were kicking off um, you know, an open online foundations of investing course. And we decided to, we were like, how do we get people excited about being engaged and being involved in this? So 
we were like, you know, we're going to do a giveaway where we, to incentivize people to open their first investment account, we're going to see their first trades with $100, right? So we, were, we had $10,000 earmarked for this. Um, we announced the, the campaign, and I think we hit that 100 new investor target in less than 24 hours. And, you know, we, received, we were inundated with hundreds of emails initially, like, hey, I've always wanted to invest, but always thought it was intimidating, I was afraid, I want to be a part of this. Um, and so then it was kind of a dual-sided thing. We had more and more people saying, I want to contribute to what you're doing. I want to fund someone else's account. And obviously we had, you know, tons more people saying, I want to open an account, I want to be involved. And so now it's become this kind of virtuous cycle mm. where we've, it was our first time actually raising um, donations for a philanthropic cause, and we're at $100,000 now that's been raised for this, and it's going. Um, so that speaks to a broader point that everyone that we've engaged with or tried to help or work with in some way, I've been, I've been uh, taken by how much they in turn wanted to help or give to someone else. Mm -hmm. That's great, and, and you're giving them a platform and a pathway to do it, <clears throat> to do it which I think is, is really important and helpful. Um, to the field. John, I'm curious as to what you're seeing as behavior that is quote unquote working. Uh, some interesting or innovative models that you've seen um, with, poten you know, with the potential to scale. It, there's so much that's happening that, um, that has real promise and that I think breaks the mold for the way, again, these policies have traditionally had impact. Um, so I think about a couple of things. One of the common themes you find in opportunity zone communities is uh, places that should have assets, but but, but instead they're being they're they're behaving like liabilities. And another way to say that is, you have government-owned vacant land in prime areas of a, of a city that no one even really knows who owns it or who's accountable for it. But it's just not doing anything. It's not creating a tax base. It's not. Uh, generate any kind of uh, draw for people to come into a city to spend their money. It's not creating any kind of housing or, or commercial activity. It's just sitting there. And when you go throughout opportunity zone communities over and over again, you find that kind of that, that dynamic where there's been historically just very little accountability. Nobody knows. I, I've had governors and mayors tell me we didn't even know what the city owned or what the state owned, what was on our balance sheet. So how are you supposed to have a thriving community if some of the core assets, core property, core buildings, uh, in places that could be prime corridors of commerce and housing and, and activity, if the people who own it, if the, if the sector that owns it doesn't even know it owns it or has no accountability to do something with it. And that's a common theme. Another common theme is you have communities that were built for a much larger population that have suffered depopulation, have had industrial displacement, and now you have the infrastructure and the bones of a community that was once thriving, but nobody with any ideas or capital to put those things to new use. So one thing we hear about is uh, a lot of old factories and mills uh, being put to new use. Actually, this kind of gets to your to, to your example of uh, uh, taking property and, and, and uh, adaptive reuse. That's happening in a lot of places. It's happening in, in kind of emerging industries. So you have vertical farming, you have salmon farming and old paper mills in the Northeast up to taking these abandoned mills that were once the centerpiece of the town's economy and are now putting them to use for an industry that's really an emerging industry with huge demand in the U.S. that can help to revive these communities in the process. Uh, you have connectivity uh, funds that are, are set up to close the digital divide and go into places where major carriers don't lay infrastructure and therefore the local residents don't have access to high-speed internet, local businesses can't create a thriving online business. You have these kind of basic amenities that are missing, and in some cases, they scale very well nationally, because if you can do it in one of these places, you can do it in dozens or hundreds of places along the same model. So we're seeing a lot of that type of creativity. In each of those cases, there's really strong engagement with the specific needs of the community, and this is where I really want to um, underscore what Elise said. This is smart investing, to go in and really uh, uh, adapt your strategy to the, to the uh, potentiality and the local assets and needs of a community, and to get buy-in early really does make everything else easier. It de-risks your investment, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it helps you fine-tune a model that then can scale in other places. Because once you have that track record, that's transferable to the next community and the next community and the next community. So we're seeing a lot of that type of malleability of the incentive being put to use. But I do want to underscore it's, it's very early. So some of the most creative stuff that we know about 
is not public. There's been no press release. It's not going to be public for two or three or six months. Uh, but those are the areas, because we're getting into that first real wave of the market. Everything to date has been essentially pre-market activity. The regs are not done. Investors are still learning about this every day. People who could be either major contributors to a fund or fund managers or local eligible businesses or public sector stakeholders today still learning about this almost two years into it being law. So I think 2020 is the year where we're going to really find out what the scale and potential of the market looks like. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see some of those creative models emerge that then create a lot of copycat, in a positive way, a lot of copycat behavior in the second and third tier um, markets. So that's what I'm excited about. And I I think a lot of it really does get away from what has traditionally been, or to date been, a very heavy real estate and traditional real estate focus. Mm -hmm. You're going to start to see that boundary get pushed way further out, I think, as, as the momentum and the maturity continues. Yeah, and Elise, I would like to, to hand it over to you on that. On the, um, I think you and, and, and your initiatives and Blueprint are, are really looking at a collaborative approach between both bricks and mortar and the businesses that fill it uh, as your approach to Opportunity Zone. So can you talk a little bit about that and um, what that looks like in real life as you, as you pursue the strategy? Yeah, certainly. I think it, it, it switches your focus of traditional investing from transactional deal flow of this deal vis-a-vis this one to how do you look at a place and say what's going to make this area thrive, almost as if you were buying an index fund on pick your small area of a city. And it's just a little bit of a different way of thinking about investing. And when you start thinking about the growth of that area as a whole over time, it's less about, again, just my what is my one investment going to look like in a model over 10 years? It's how do I bring in different stakeholders from a bunch of different groups. And we often think of kind of four groups that are just core and necessary and need to be involved in a city. You have your investors, your developers that are providing capital and deal expertise. You have your community stakeholders that really need to be involved in idea generation, particularly for greenfield real estate development. I think it's really core of going to a community first before you even create a plan. You also have government, talked a little bit about how, how they've been involved. And then you also have this nonprofit piece as well, which we found to be really interesting. I mean, this is a tax incentive for taxpaying investors, but seeing the abundance of nonprofit endowment foundations that are getting really excited about potentially putting capital to work as a mission-related investment because they really care about an area and see this as a way to scale their investment in both the real estate and operating company side, I think is something exciting and it's bringing together people around a table that traditionally weren't getting around the table and having that conversation. I think if it's done in the right way, that's really one of the most interesting ways that, that collaboration can push a place forward on a number of different levels, not just one project that's making money. You have to loop in community banks, think about small business lending. This is an equity incentive, not a debt incentive, but debt plays a really important piece too. It just it makes you think more holistically about the entire community, and I think that'll be important on, over the long term. Absolutely. Um, I'm interested in the, in the non-tax-paying entities, the, the world of philanthropy. We've seen uh, some national philanthropies really step up and and help toward drive impact in this space. Uh, We've seen Kresge give first loss guarantees to to community capital management and Arcteris. We've seen Rockefeller support local, you know, TA at the local level. Uh, We're doing some work with the Lumina Foundation focused on the role of higher education institutions and how they can really act as anchor institutions within opportunity zones, which I think can happen in a whole myriad of ways. Uh, Oftentimes they can be conveners, they can be a trusted community intermediary. Uh, There's actually an HBCU, uh, Historical Black Colleges and Universities, uh, OZ fund that has been been started and um, they're doing some really interesting uh, work within within opportunity zones and driving impact. Uh, So it it is an interesting thing and a really helpful thing uh, to uh, for these non-tax paying entities to really help be, um, help catalyze impact in, in these neighborhoods. Um, John, are you seeing it in any other ways? We have philanthropy, we have higher ed. Uh, are you seeing the non-tax paying entities, any other, any, uh, any other groups that are really catalyzing uh, OZ investments? I just want to go back to kind of the, the premise there, because right? I agree that they can be so critical this is one area, though, for me that's been a disappointment so okay. far because I think the the philanthropic sector in general has been, in, at scale, I think, missing in action. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so you have two years of a market being shaped, 
that's the prime window for philanthropy to have stepped in and said, we're going to really help to that 22 million you mentioned with Kresge is fantastic. Why is that not 220 million or 2 billion of mm -hmm. loss guarantee is not invested capital either. Mm -hmm. It's just a backstop. So, and, and if they do their jobs right, they're picking funds that are never going to need the loss guarantee, but it helps to de-risk for the private investors to really get them off the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason this is so important, Jen, is that the, the narrative that Opportunity Zones has unleashed a torrent of capital is wrong. It is hard to raise money right now. It is very, very hard. If you, there was just an article this week in the Wall Street Journal about how most fund managers are out there probably at 10 or 15 or 20 percent of their, their raise goal, and that's pretty pervasive. There are some funds that closed very quickly, had phenomenal success. Those are impact funds in, in many cases. So it's not universally true, but as a marketplace, this is still new, and it's still high risk and perceived as high risk by most investors who could put their capital to use. The incentive is very powerful, but on its own, it's not going to change behavior without all the other stakeholders, including those non-taxpaying stakeholders that have a that have an obvious role to play in shaping the marketplace unless they step up. So what we're seeing with the loss guarantee, for example, is that those funds are going to be phenomenally successful, I think, as a result of having that backstop. And the credibility that comes with that, having been blessed by uh, by Kresge and having that as a, a tool to be able to, to shake loose more capital from investors. But I'm just sad that two years in, we don't have more of that type of very basic, it's not, this is not rocket science, it's just very basic engagement from philanthropy on an issue, by the way, that they're supposed to care about, on an issue that they are, they are literally capitalized, that they have a huge tax incentive, uh, tax benefit to, uh, to do this very type of work. And here we have this transformational window we're two years in, we don't have the kind of scale that we should have. So yes, we're seeing some of it. I don't think we're seeing nearly enough of it. We're also seeing another example of kind of anchor institutions and in some cases non-taxpayers non that are helping to lead the way is hospital systems yep. uh, in, in these communities. It's yep. just fantastic uh, using, using their foothold in a community to go into affordable housing uh, developments for their local residents and doing, doing things that help to anchor and catalyze the whole market of activity. We're seeing this in Cleveland. We're seeing this in several different areas. So I'm, I'm hugely optimistic that once you get to that type of mm -hmm. stakeholdership from, the, from the, those anchors, many of whom, again, are non-taxpaying and are not directly incented by this, but see the overlay with their mission, uh, that's where you really start to get to the creative potential and the scale potential that, mm -hmm. that today has been pretty elusive. No, I think that that's important candor, so we, we appreciate it. <clears throat> and I agree on the, on the, it's eds and meds, right? So higher ed educational systems can be huge catalysts for, for impact behavior in this space. The medical systems can as well. We're seeing it in Philly actually too, where we have a, an investor, we put together an opportunity zone investor council. We have an investor who is looking at um, his whole, his whole, he's a celebrity chef. And so his whole mission is, really access to healthy foods, who's partnered up with an entrepreneur accelerator in Philadelphia, and they're really looking at food as, um, as wellness. And so they've teamed up with the local children's hospital to scale out some of their ideas and get some cross-pollinated programming going between. Um, and it really just speaks to that holistic neighborhood development. They're doing a mixed-use deal in a zone in Philly uh, where they're going to be uh, helping accelerate um, uh, food and beverage entrepreneurs and catering and things like that predominantly people of color in West Philly. So we're starting to see that holistic neighborhood development and the anchor institutions playing a really vital part in scaling out some of the ideas within the local communities because oftentimes they're the largest uh, workforce provider, largest employer, um, and can really act as a community intermediary. I'm curious on the from the practitioners on the panel, um, we've talked a, mostly about optimism, but appreciate John's lead on the candor for you know, where he wants to see philanthropy um, step up. What are your uh, headwinds that, that you're experiencing and where would you like to see some you know, additional support or partnership uh, along the way? Mike, you're, you wanna yeah. take that? Um, well, first, I think to underline what John said, it's, it's um, it is early, and and I think you know we live in this world of of wanting, needing instant feedback and results and gratification and whatnot. And we you know we read, you know we read these articles about well opportunity zones haven't transformed the entire country, therefore it must have been a failure. Well, you know this was rolled out two years ago, and by nature of these uh, you know, opportunity zones are, are generally meant to create 
development and new activity. You don't go buy an existing building and sit on it and that's an opportunity zone project. It, this is something that's transformational. And so we need to be patient, to John's point, and, and think, you know, keep in mind, this is the real benefit comes from an economic standpoint comes 10 years down the road. So this isn't a, you know, this isn't a short term, you know, quick flip kind of a, um, kind of a situation. I think, Jen, to your, to your question, um, I think what, what we've seen work well and, and not work well um, across different communities, markets we're looking at, um, to, put it, to put it simply, the cities and the local leadership who understand the power of this legislation, the ones that really get it have put resources, and not, not talking, you know, tens and millions of dollars and lots of, lots of you know, putting a big staff behind this, but the communities that have put an opportunity zone czar in the mayor's office or, or in the economic development uh, department of a, of a particular city, um, they're the ones who are really out f figuring out how to attract the capital, how to attract the non-taxpaying entities who could, uh, who could uh, supplement what's happening from an OZ investment standpoint. Um, we see they're the ones that are winning. They're the ones that are winning. When we go candidly with, like, with, with Merced, California, which is, again, smaller town, so they're not a ton of resources to go put behind marketing themselves as an OZ destination, but smaller town, whether they just haven't grasped, um, haven't had the, the time, energy, resources to go figure out how do we fit in this world of, of OZ and, and what, who can we attract and what, what can we do in this, in our city that's going to make, you know, that's going to make us stand out over time. And it, that to us has been kind of the have and have nots. And, 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 you know, as we see, hopefully over time, as we see cities get, you know, more organized around this and really bring like Elise said, bring the stakeholders together. It needs, it requires the city, it requires the local um, private developers, it requires um, other, you know, community, um, community involvement that's really gonna, it's gonna um, help elevate the, the profile of that, of that particular city. That's where it's gonna be successful, mm -hmm. in our opinion, and where we've seen the disconnect or the, maybe the lack of momentum has been has been due to just a lack of understanding and education and under, you know we're really having a clear vision as to how to maximize the benefit of this. Yeah, we've been really inspired by I think Alex is here. Alex Foxbart, is he here? Yep. So, uh, Alex loves the state of Alabama and has done has gotten his hustle on and has really ignited uh, a lot of collaborative behavior. Uh, and just really um, telling the story of the great state of Alabama. And there's going to be kind of over market, over opportunity zone market investment in that state for sure, given just his drive and ability to really advocate uh, for this state. We're seeing uh, similar things in Baltimore. You know, Ben Siegel is there as the Baltimore Opportunity Zone coordinator. So the human capital and capacity at the local level and those Mayor Tubbs in Stockton is doing an amazing job of, of telling the story of, of his city. And so we are seeing these, these real heroes of their, of their homes. Um, Mayor Dave, David Holt in Oklahoma City. I mean, I wanna invest in OKC because that man loves his city so much and has done a lot to really outreach and tell the story um, and put some, some resourcing to helping investors you know, find deals and, uh, and have community engagement mean community is part of the capital stack, um, which is what we would really like to see uh, as our framework is being implemented. So I think that's just a really important point. Um, Dave and Elise, is there anything, anybody else you want to kind of call to step up in this space that you'd like to see more of or headwinds that you want to, you think would be helpful to talk about? Well, j just because you mentioned it, I, I do think that something that I'm hopeful to see in the future is evolution of thought around that point, around community wealth. I mean, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit as far as creating local jobs and supporting local businesses, which I think a lot of impact-oriented groups, ourselves included, are, are being forefront thinkers on. I do think that there's going to be this next step of evolution on how do you actually help the individuals, the community stakeholders create wealth alongside. And we're seeing some interesting talk and contemplating some interesting talking on this end, but I mentioned 
it just, I think it's a really easy step is just making sure you talk with the local community before you make your investment plan. And that can go a long way in kind of spreading the opportunity for everyone involved. Some other interesting models, I mean, empowering local community land banks to acquire land before you do a development so they can participate in any appreciation and land values, I think is really interesting. And then even some models around equity ownership, so crowdfunding and making sure even if it's a small piece that individuals in a community could own a piece of what you're doing. I think these are all really interesting ideas and, and to echo also some of John's points of just what's going to come in the future. I, I hope that that's something that becomes more creative over time and, and that you see more of. And actually, I think it's a place where philanthropy can also play a role in bridging some of those uh, capital funding gaps. So. David, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, from my perspective, it's so early on in the, in the evolution of this market space that it's hard for me when I engage with people to talk about tangible successes or failures. Mm -hmm. um, but when I engage at the local government or the community level, um, I met with a lot of skepticism because all they know about the legislation and the impact of it is what they read in the popular press. Um, you know, and so I, I genuinely believe that, you know, emotion is the currency that incentivizes change. Mm -hmm. And so for this to work, you know, I think people that are kind of at the forefront of this, gonna, they're gonna have to find the narratives um, that really demonstrate and share, you know, how impactful this can be and show successes um, to effectuate that, that to elicit that buy-in at the community level that we all keep talking about is so important to really drive impact and change. That's great. I think we have some handheld mics. We have a few minutes left. Uh, just want to open up, up to the floor for Q and A. Um, do we have a mic? Run? Yeah, we have a. Thank you, everyone. I'm Catherine Chen with RBC Wealth Management. I have a question about timing. Um, I know we're early on, um, but um, my understanding is that the maximum amount of the capital gain deferral and the benefit, if it's not funded by the end of this year, you know, obviously, you know, every year you wait, there's a portion that gets reduced. So I just want to reconcile that with the concept of somehow losing some of the maximum benefit, and then your comment of there's even more and more capital co to come. What um, disadvantage or, you know, some sort of haircut you think that will matter in terms of people being willing to allocate money knowing that they're going to lose some of the capital gains maximum benefit? Do you want to take that, John? Or Mike? Yeah, I would, I would, great question. And that's, that's exactly right. There's some of, some of the upfront benefit does go away if you're not, if you haven't placed the capital this year into, into a fund. Um, uh, is a we we talk about this every week. So I, I think our our view on this is that 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 upfront benefit is kind of the bonus, but the real from an economic standpoint, the real benefit is the is the capital gain um, is the the uh, forgiveness of the capital gain on the new on the new investment that that goes in. So you know, and you you, you know you do need to wait ten years to 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 um, uh, to realize that. And so by by definition. You're, you know, you have to look at these things as long-term investments. The again, that that uh, the upfront capital gain, it's 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 a, it's a nice pop. It, it does add uh, it does add to our return profile. But we're you know we really look at it as the the long game is the is the is the ten-year capital gain waiver. Hi, uh, I'm Oscar Perriabello, senior economics correspondent at Next City. Uh, I'm really interested in this community wealth uh, thread that came up at the end here. So uh, the deferral, the step up, step up in basis, that applies to capital gains income. But I'm starting to hear discussions around the 10-year the benefit should be accessible to any investors in the funds or the projects, even if they're not investing capital gains income up front. And I'm hearing some discussion around the IRS doesn't think that right now, but maybe it could. Uh, John, you design, you help design this. What, what's your take on like that that ten year benefit? Is that should that be accessible to someone investing a hundred dollars into an opportunity zone fund? So it's a good question. Let's talk about what the word should means there. Uh, in a in a perfect world, yes. And the decision to actually narrow that was one to reduce the potential cost profile of an already pretty cheap provision of the tax. Uh, of the tax code, of the tax bill. So, so the, so yeah, I'd say in terms of original vision and what what we would hope for as a as a mechanism to move capital, 
you've got one series of benefits tied to capital gains reinvested, and you could have a second stream of, if you don't have capital gains to reinvest, but you want to support these communities, you want to make these long-term investments, then you're getting the tenure, you're getting access to the tenure benefit. Right now, that's not the way it's being interpreted. That's not the way it's been, uh, it's it's been codified. Um, but I think these are the kind of things that as Congress looks to iterate, which tax policy is always iterative, they look to iterate this and say, where can we get additional uh, engagement in the policy, and how can we create new avenues for wealth building within the community itself? That would be one way absolutely to do that. Um, but I just want to note, there's trade-offs everywhere. And so one of the critiques is that this is too big of an incentive. One of the uh, critiques is this is too little of an incentive. There's some kind of happy medium we have to reach, and I think with this first iteration, that's where uh, we need to, it's part of the reason why data collection is also so important is that over time we want to understand as close to real time as we can how this is moving and you apply that knowledge to improving and iterating the policy uh, over time. There's things that Congress can do now uh, to, to take care of that. There's also next generation Opportunity Zone 2.0 because this is just a fraction of the countries. it's a large fraction, but it's just a fraction of the eligible communities. So if you can imagine a world in which they expand that, these are the kind of things that I'd want them to consider because I think that's where you get to much, it's, it's not just a uptake question, it's also ease of implementation. Without the capital gains uh, timing considerations and questions, it's actually much easier to deploy capital and, and to time that for fund managers and for investors alike. So I think, I think of this as kind of the pilot concept and then there's plenty of ways you could expand that and set the dial uh, differently over time. It's a good question. I think we have time for one more. Did I see a hand up over here? Um, Lisa Richter, Avivar Capital. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm glad you got into the timing question because one of the things that I hear in, in challenged communities is, that, is they just haven't had the time to get organized for this. And um, it, it almost seems as though we need that 2.0 or the ability to get on that trajectory sooner rather than later. <clears throat> but the question I wanted to ask is, um, the, if so much uh, emphasis is focused on the capital gain generated within the 10-year investment period, the new investment, uh, that seems to carry automatic incentives for things that have always um, been very challenging in community revitalization strategies, i.e. displacement. And I'm just wondering, to what extent, um, John and others, do you, would you give comfort that the structure of the program itself has some mitigation for that risk? Not complimentary philanthropy, but the program itself. Thanks. I don't want to monopolize this, so I'll just I'll answer very briefly. I think the answer is yes. The nature of the incentive is build new capacity or improve existing capacity substantially. So you can't just buy a building, kick out the residents, claim the tax benefit after 10 years after the thing appreciates. You have to, in, in a housing context, for example, build new capacity or improve existing capacity. So for example, what we've seen is affordable housing developers who have existing assets within opportunity zones, they go back to their, their portfolio and say, where can we add new units to substantially improve these previous things? So you're adding hundreds or thousands of new units to those, uh, those types of buildings. Uh, so there's some basic guardrails that keep, that because of the nature of the way the incentive is delivered uh, that uh, are additive. But I think we often skip the really important part of this conversation when it comes to displacement and, and attuning to the community's needs, state and local policymakers have an enormous toolkit that they can deploy and they should deploy to make sure that this is being shaped uh, towards their local residents. In most opportunity zone communities, displacement from gentrification is simply not the concern. And I think it's really important to distinguish the percentage that do is small, but it's meaningful. But for the most Part. You're talking about communities that have depopulated, that have tons of vacant housing and, and available stock, that desperately need an up, uptake and uplift of their housing values and housing stock. It's just a different playbook. It's a different set of concerns. It's not that one is more important than the other. It's that you have to right size what is the concern that we should be prioritizing to the communities in question. And I think too much of the, not just with opportunities, zones, too much of the broad conversation about community revitalization is dominated by Washington, D.C., New York City, San Francisco. And those, those conditions do not exist in Akron, Ohio, or in South Bend, Indiana. That's just not the reality. So you need, a, you need to understand what those realities are and, and attune to that. And that's where local leadership is so important, because they control zoning, they control permitting, they control fast tracking, and all kinds of other tools that they can use to shape the incentive. They also have other incentives themselves 
to, to skew towards affordable housing or uh, workforce housing or other things that make it easier to avoid displacement. So there's a lot of room for that kind of creativity and it's it's not a fait accompli that it's going to be used a specific way. That's where the, the local ground up side is so important. And to that point, uh, you know, there's 8,764 zones. Urban Institute did a study that less than 5% have risk of gentrification. Gentrification meaning forced migration. So it's a very small percentage uh, and we need to be mindful of the other 95% and, and what's going on there. Both are important, but um, just to put it in context, it's a fairly small percentage where there's some, some sort of forced migration risk. I wanna thank my panelists. Um, I wanna thank uh, John for, for really helping push this legislation that- Is it set up to talk about Baby Shark? No, oh, well, do you wanna do it? I didn't wanna embarrass you, I, but I did, I did tell him that, ask him to, to uh, be, yeah, Alex is egging you on. Are there any Nationals fans in the audience? Are there any Baby Shark fans in the audience? <laughs> oh, you've got it on tee up. Can you hear it? There we go. Come on. <laughs> um, so everybody should be it's the ready. The first time that's happened with an Opportunity Zone panel. So, so <laughs> Baby <highly> Shark. Real. <laughs> um, no, thank you. <laughs> um, but thank you for, for penning legislation that the, the conversation swell around it. It's really precious. It's, it's an opportunity to drive impact across the country and it's setting some tables where innovation happens under circumstances like these. So Thanks. we appreciate everybody, everybody's hard work and thanks for being with us this morning.